Hey there, welcome back to the channel, and in this video we're going to be talking about the 10 weirdest Pawn Star deals. If you're a fan of Pawn Stars, make sure you leave a like on the video. Also, make sure to subscribe and hit the bell notification so you can be notified when we release our daily videos. Now with all that being said, let's get right to the video. Number 10. Vintage Electroshock Machine X-ray machine. Very old. So can I see this thing in action? Oh no, 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 no. I don't think I'd even think about plugging this in. I'm sure the guy who operated it back then didn't live a very long from Season 4 episode Weird Science comes yet another electroshock therapy device. I won't begin to wonder why so many of these are scattered across Las Vegas or why so many of them wind up at the pawn shop. Given the odd and painful nature of these machines, it's strange that so many people own them and feel that others are willing to buy. But then again, the guys feel that there's someone out there that collects vintage electroshock therapy devices, and with several of them popping up on Pawn Stars, maybe they have a point. This one actually works, and yes, they test it on each other. The seller makes out like a bandit with $75 in her pocket. A shocking purchase if you ask me. So, uh, what do you want to do with it, my man? I'd like to sell it. Okay, um, what are you looking to get out of it? I'd like $800. Number 9. Sterling Silver Tiffany Walkman Hey, what's up? I have a dated 1857 silver bucket from Tiffany & Company. This one came from a yard sale. <laughs> Just out of curiosity. Rick states right off the bat that old electronics are useless, and that remains true, even if they're covered with luxurious silver by famous jewelry maker Tiffany & Company, or if they're gifted by John Entwistle. While the pedigree on this device may be impressive, the thing plays cassettes. Good luck finding one of those in 2018. The seller, a woman with wild nails and glasses, was once married to Entwistle, which is how she acquired this illustrious Walkman. Sony collaborated with Tiffany to create these relics to mark the anniversary of what was basically the original iPod. A cool story for an item that went through several owners, but again, cassettes. After some impressive haggling, she talks Rick up from 700 to 1250 Why Rick? Why? But the antiques like there used to be in the past, it's not uncommon to find something that is something of very high value that they don't place value on, but they just want Number 8, 1950s transfusion kit. That's right, because doctors are the only people that bring this freaky crap in to sell to me. <laughs> right. I came to the pawn shop to sell some antique medical instruments. There's something eerie about this from the get-go. The seller, a woman with a slightly macabre disposition, states that it's for the lazy vampire and remarks that she doesn't need it any longer. Hmm. Also strangers are oddly exact asking price of $211. The device itself would make even those with strong stomachs queasy. It's easily portable, and when it opens up, it reveals an array of jars and tubes. Simple enough, remove the blood from one person, transfer it into a jar, move it to another jar, and move the blood into the recipient. Old spooky medical devices give most people the heebie-jeebies, and one as truly bloody as this is sure to do the trick. An even spookier exchange happens after Chumley offers 100. The seller gives him the stare and scares him up to a smooth 125. It's out of my collection. I'm hoping to get uh, 1750 for the bone drilling set and the trocar. So what kind of doctor are you? Well, I'm a psychiatrist. Number seven, novelty can of elephant waste. I got a pest collection I'm looking to unload today. You got any candy? No, these have no candy in them at all. These are all from the 1960s. From season 5 episode Zudu comes one of the more ridiculous items to ever be seen on Pawn Stars, a can of elephant manure. From the second this guy opens his specialized carrying case, the look on the old man's and Chumley's faces were priceless. The seller, in a clear attempt at trolling, sets his asking price at 10000 Nice try, but the old man's not having it. But Chumley is certainly amused. The seller thinks that this is a valuable one-off that could fetch quite a bit of cash with the right buyer. Chumley, still interested, is told that if he buys this can of manure, it's coming out of his own paycheck. So how much did he cough up? 20 bucks. Red Power Ranger. You don't think you need it until you see it, though. I'm sorry, man. It's just not for me. It's just not the right fit for the shop. Number 6. One Man Submarine something that you actually use or yes i've used it quite a bit so what do you fish with this anything that looks tasty and is legal to shoot <laughs> okay i went sea bass fishing i just used the pole rolling up into the parking lot for this one is a truly bizarre machine it's a one-man submarine called the midget and this one's from the 80s rick informs us that a fully restored midget submarine can fetch upwards of 10,000, which is hard to believe considering the idea of submarines in general make most people uneasy let alone one that fits one person only 
Nevertheless, he's intrigued, and granted, it's not often you see a white man submarine at all, let alone one smack dab in the middle of Las Vegas. This one, however, needs some tender love and care. The seller gets nowhere near her asking price, but manages to walk away with a hefty 3000 Wondering where they're going to use this one person submarine? There's lakes, the seller says. In the spear gun theme, I set up a large shark balloon, and it's a little windy, so it's actually like a bit of a moving target, but at least we get four chances. Number five, Little Orphan Annie Decoder Pin. Mostly because I like that movie, A Christmas Story. The only problem is this one did not rotate very well, so I popped it apart to find out what kind of mechanism. This item is objectively not so bad. As with its gold embellishments and retro charm, it could be a neat trick for the right buyer. Therein lies the problem. The right buyer would have to be interested in such a specific item, or as the guys remark, a specific collector of any memorabilia. Maybe there's more of those out there than it seems. The pin itself was created sometimes around the 30s or 40s when Annie was running as a popular radio program. They would announce over the radio a coded message, and you would use your decoder pin at home to decode said message, hopefully revealing a deep truth about life itself, or at least a fun message pertaining to Annie. The message on this decoder pin? Be sure to drink your Ovaltine. Okay, there, that feels pretty smooth. Now we just need to do a little bit of bending so that I can get that. Number four, Slash's driver's license. Silver plated, personally given to John Antwistle. From the who? Yeah, he was my first husband. Whoa, you must have had a really crazy life. Uh. Yeah, that was a lot of fun. Lest you forget, world famous gold and silver pawn shop is open 24 hours, and in the middle of the night strolls in a man full of confidence, stating boldly he has a driver's license of a band member from Guns N' Roses. This should be interesting. Chumley is uneasy about negotiating for the wild asking price of 50000 He calls in Rick, a big fan of rock and roll, to come down and take a look for himself. Rick is none too pleased to be coming in at such a late hour, but he does. Rick asks the questions on everybody's mind. Why would anyone pay 50 grand for a Slash's driver's license? The seller assures him that there is a market out there for this. Rick offers 1000 but the man walks. No deal and back to bed. 20. I'll give you 10 grand for the hat. I think you're crazy for offering him 10 grand, honestly. I'm gonna bow out. Number three, Ivory Tusk. It's an ivory and silver conductor's baton, and it's engraved to the conductor of the Red Rooster Brothel in San Francisco. Pawn shops are known for wading into some ethical ambiguity, but this ivory tusk is pushing the envelope. The seller purchased it on a trip to Taiwan, and this had to have been before the ivory trade was controversial as it is today. Rick can tell right away that it's not even real ivory, it's bone. Not only that, but he wouldn't be too interested in buying real ivory anyway. He doesn't want to get involved in something so political. And can you blame him? The seller is bummed to learn that she was hoodwinked in her original purchase, but she tries to attempt a sale on aesthetic value. Rick rejects this and sends her packing. It definitely is ivory. It is old, I don't doubt the age. Um, one of the ways you can tell is because it's been illegal to have ivory in California. Number two, a Marilyn Manson figurine. I came to the pawn shop today to try and sell my first issue of Playboy magazine, the Marilyn Monroe issue. Celebrity Deathmatch was a cult hit for MTV at the turn of the new millennium and goth rocker Marilyn Manson was a frequent appearance on the excessively violent animated satire. He even earned a Grammy nomination for penning a song on the soundtrack. When the seller walks in with an original claymation figure he purchased from someone involved in the production, the pawn stars were definitely amused. To check its value, they have it appraised by one of their experts. The original seller bought it for $8,000. Its appraisal value? $1,500. Well, he's bummed to hear this, he tries to haggle his way somewhere near his original purchase. Big Hoss stands firm at $500, and the seller walks. Not only did he potentially overpay, he also implied that the Marilyn Manson figure was actively haunting his house. Playboy. Awesome. <laughs> I came to the pawn shop today to try and sell my first issue. And finally, number one, Odd Fingerprints. This one takes the cake. Saddam Hussein was a corrupt and brutal dictator that led one of the most repressive regimes in modern history. These fingerprints taken at the time of his capture are unsettling and a little shocking. The seller was involved in Hussein's capture and was given one of a few certified copies of the prints as a gift. 
Rick remarks that he normally doesn't buy memorabilia related to bad people, but he has an inkling that someone out there would be interested. Aside from the sentimental value this holds for the seller himself, why would somebody want this hanging on their wall? Rick is then faced with a conundrum. Putting a price on something so creepy won't be easy. He doesn't offer anywhere near the asking price of 10000 and the man walks. 